Hi guys, welcome to our uh, next recording. Today we're going to be looking at corporate governance. So I'll just um, share my screen and then we can um, get going. So here we go. All right, so we're going to be looking at corporate governance, like I said. Um, there's a few uh, slides here on learning objectives. Now, what I normally say to people is come back and look at them after you've watched the video to make sure you understand the content. Um, probably doesn't have a lot of relevance to you at the moment because we haven't been through the material yet. And uh, this particular diagram is good for when you're doing your revision and your study, it gives you an understanding of the main factors that you need to understand um, in this particular chapter. Okay, so I'll leave that with you and then we'll get on straight into our lecture. So interest in corporate governance practice has increased because there's been a lot of highly publicized cases of corporate misconduct and concern about the management of corporations. So in Australia, we've talked about ABC Learning, we've talked about Enron and WorldCom overseas. And so there's been a lot of talk about it in the media. And there's also a growing realization that good corporate governance, it doesn't only just help avoid problems, it really does make the organization a better organization. And hopefully if it makes it a better organization, it may also mean that they can improve their profitability and those types of things. Okay, so what are the problems? <clears throat> So why do we have this interest in corporate governance? Well, it's the problems with the management of corporations. Some of the things that can happen is that those managing a company can use the resources to benefit themselves rather than the shareholders. So we call that the agency problems. Corporations may take actions that shareholders may not consider desirable. So the corporation could do something that uh, has a harmful effect on the environment and shareholders aren't particularly happy with that. Corporations may hide or provide false information to shareholders to avoid certain consequences, okay? And the last one, in this page at least, is that it's this disparity. Some people believe that managers or some of the internal management are paid more than they're really worth because what they're being paid is not being reflected in the performance of the company and people get upset about that, okay? So the risk in not having good corporate governance practices is high. And a lot of people have linked this to the global financial crisis. Poor management led to poor lending decisions or poor management culture led, led to poor lending decisions, led to too much money being lent to people who couldn't repay it led to the credit crunch, led to the property bubble, and therefore led to the global financial crisis. Okay. For the economy, poor, a lack of public confidence in an organisation can lead, if it happens across a number of organisations, can result in reduced economic growth. Okay. And of course, if there's poor corporate governance and we see these corporate failures, people may lose some of the confidence in the accounting profession itself, and they may not believe that it's living up to its expectation, okay? So companies that can demonstrate good corporate governance practices are going to have advantage, advantages, okay? Increasing globalization of businesses and competition for capital, okay? Companies that can provide assurance that the company is appropriately managed can gain a competitive advantage. Why is that? Well, if you can show that you are well managed, it means for the potential investors, there's less risk and people are going to feel a lot more comfortable investing in a company with lower risk and a higher return than a company with the same level of return and a much higher level of risk. So you're reducing the risk and that makes investment more attractiveness. Okay. And as I said, reducing risks to investors can reduce the cost of capital. 
expanding company shareholders to a broader base combined with more organized and active shareholder lobby groups, it might put a bit more scrutiny on company management if, than if it's just a, a small number of shareholders. A broader increased number of shareholders mean that more people take an interest in the organization and therefore as a result, okay, it may mean that there's more scrutiny, et cetera, on management. All right, so what is corporate governance? The procedures and proce processes according to which an organization is directed and controlled. So it's really about how the board acts and how management acts. We can define it as a structure which specifies the distributions of the rights and responsibility amongst the different participants in the organization, i.e. what's management's responsibility and what's the board's responsibility. It's also, as part of this, we can set, attain and monitor various objectives, okay? Now, determination of whose interests are to be protected and what are appropriate objectives is gonna have an influence on corporate governance. So in Australia, we follow the Anglo-Saxon model. And under this Anglo-Saxon model, we basically say that the aim of the corporation is to manage shareholder wealth. When we look at the laws in Australia, we talk about the protection of shareholders. And so therefore corporate governance is consistent with that. And our corporate governance requirements talk about the protection of shareholders. The Anglo-Saxon model is the basis for many corporate governance models, including Asia, where there is a convergence to this model, okay? And it's about maximizing that shareholder value. But that's not the only model we use around the world. Now, the reason we use a, well, the reason, one of the reasons that we use this um, Anglo-Saxon model, it just basically comes from the fact that a lot of the uh, countries that use it were former British colonies, and also the fact that they have a common law basis in um, law. But there are other models. German models of corporate governance enter, uh, emphasize multiple stakeholders and other European countries have more focus on employees. So if you look at the German model, they talk about protecting stakeholders and maximizing stakeholder wealth and their laws talk about protecting stakeholders. So it's not just shareholders, it's the employees, the suppliers and the customers are part of their model. Corporate governance systems are increasingly considering stakeholders beyond the traditional shareholder groups, okay? And so we're seeing a move away from just um, focusing on shareholders. We're seeing a move to being good stewards of the environment and thinking about our other stakeholders as well, okay? Now, rules and prescriptions are needed because of the nature of most company structures. Capital con uh, contributors do not actually run the company. No, there's a separation between the shareholders and management because management runs the company. And that is one of the sources of the problems associated with corporate governance because the shareholders or capital contributors may not feel that management is running the company the way that they would expect, okay? Now, positive accounting theory provides an explanation as to why there's a bias or a distortion of the financial statements. Um, positive accounting theory is about describing the actions within the market, right? So positive accounting theory explains that for efficiency reasons, Companies are formed and can be viewed as a network or a nexus of contracts or agreement that determine the relationship with and among the various parties involved in the firm. There's an agency relationship that arises from this nexus, okay, i.e. there's a separation of management and there's a separation 
of control. Okay, because basically managers, uh, sorry, cap, capital contributors authorize the managers to make key business decisions on their behalf and they may not necessarily make the best decisions on behalf of the contributors, okay? A little bit of a diagram here. One thing we've got to keep in mind is, yes, we can have an agency problem, and with that, we have agency costs, okay? And as you know, there's various ways around managing the agency problem, okay? And we've talked about that in the past. With this in mind, it's generally acknowledged that there is no one system of corporate governance, okay? The way the organization or the corporate governance required or desired or the practices will depend on the nature of the particular corporation and the environment in which it operates, okay? Now, what does that mean? So there are codes of good corporate governance outlined by the OECD, the Australian Securities Exchange, which is the one we're most interested in, and the China Securities Reg Regulatory Commission. There's the Cadbury, Co uh, not the Cadbury, that was the, the name of the inquiry. There's um, uh, a code of conduct in the UK. There's a code of conduct in Singapore. Now, most of these codes of conduct, don't forget, they are voluntary, okay? They're not mandatory as required in the law, okay? Although there are differences amongst these codes, many of the principles are similar. So while there is no single model of corporate governance, there are three common focuses in corporate governance. These are controlling and directing the directors and senior management, making sure they're doing the right thing, the role of shareholders, how they contribute to the organization, and ensuring that we have transparency and accountability, okay? So what are some examples of corporate governance? Well, examples of possible corporate governance practices include things like the codes of conduct that directors should follow, minimum standards or level of experience, how much experience, or maybe it might talk about things like the terms that um, the directors should have before they roll off the board so you keep a good turnover of new people, requirements that most of the board of directors be independent, okay? Other things could be the formation of a nominating committee to identify new directors. Formation of a remuneration committee so that we go through a proper process to make sure that people are paid appropriately. Setting out the responsibilities and duties of directors. And also, what happens if a director breaches their obligations? How do we deal with that? We also have to make sure that shareholders have the ability to protect the interests of the corporation. Okay, and maybe we might be looking at a broader group, not just the shareholders, but we might be looking at the way the board and, and the senior management looks after and protects stakeholders such as employees and customers. We might ensure that stakeholders are sufficiently informed about the activities of the company, okay, and its management. But we also have to make sure that we allow managers to meet their accountability obligations, okay? So there's a lot there, and if you have a look on um, Moodle, you'll also see that there's an example of the ASX principles of corporate governance. In Australia, we have eight principles of corporate governance. There used to be 10, but they merged a few. Uh, they didn't really change that much. They just simplified, and we now have eight. Organizations don't have to follow the principles of corporate governance. But if they don't, and they're listed on the stock exchange, they have to explain to the market and to the investors and all that sort of thing, why they didn't comply. So as a result, you find that most companies do comply with those eight principles, okay? Now, when we talk about corporate governance, 
there's a couple of approaches that we can have. We can talk about rules-based approaches and principles-based approaches. Now, the rules-based approach, this approach identifies precise practices that are required or recommended to ensure good corporate governance. It's often associated with legislation or listing rules, and basically they impose penalties if the rules aren't followed. Now, the good thing about this, it provides a set of minimum corporate governance practices that must be followed by all corporations, i.e., are you following the rules? That helps with enforcement. Did they follow them or not? And it really clarifies, are people doing what they're meant to? And therefore, if they're not, do they have a liability? Um, you tend to find that when there's just a list of rules, it provides a minimum set of practices, okay? And people will often just go down the path of the minimum set and really good corporate governance may re require more effort or more uh, attention to this issue. And what ends up happening, it just encourages a bit of a checklist approach. Tick, 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 tick. Yes, I followed good corporate governance practice. The alternative to this is what we call a principles-based approach. It identifies general principles or objectives for corporate governance. So rather than identifying the exact practices that may meet this aim, um, responsibility is placed on the managers to work out which practices are appropriate. So if you have a rules-based approach, it's gonna say, yes, you can do this. No, you can't do this. Yes, no, yes, no. And I'll just give you a list, right? For a principles, it might be something like, well, let's think about it, right? The rule might be directors must, um, directors must be on the board for no more than five years. End of story, okay? Five years it is. The principles-based approach, instead of being so specific, it might say something like, directors are, uh, the organization is encouraged to make sure that directors are up to date and continue to may, to provide benefit to the organization. And so that gives you some flexibility. You might, if someone's not providing benefit, you might get rid of them after two years or you might keep them for 10, okay? Now, the good thing about this system, it places a higher level of duty on directors to determine which corporate governance practices are required than simply accepting a minimum set of practices. Its flexibility means that you can adapt them for different organizations and particular circumstances of your entity, okay? The problem is, is that they're open to interpretation and people may ignore parts and only focus on what they believe is easier or they're able to do with a minimum effort. And again, it relies on honest integrity and commitment and that may not always be present. Okay, so the global financial crisis provided an impetus for regulators, corporations, and other organizations to reconsider corporate governance, okay? So the OECD's review concluded that while the principles of corporate governance were sound, there was a gap between what people thought or the principles of what should be done and then how they were implicated, okay? So what happened here? People were given a bit of flexibility, okay, when it came to corporate governance. So the cause of the financial crisis was the failure of many corporations to manage and control risk. And we know now, or we did know then, but we didn't really pay attention to it, to effectively manage risk, you need to identify your risks, okay? You then need to perform a thorough analysis of the consequence or impact of these risks and what that's gonna have on the business. So you can't manage a risk until you know what the risk is. You can't manage a risk till you can measure that risk as well. Once you've done that, you're gonna be in a better position. You've gotta understand your risk. 
Now, once you do that, the corporation needs to put in place policies or procedures, controls or safeguards to manage these consequences, okay? Now, what else happened? Um, in some circumstances, a disjointed approach was noticed to risk management, where risk was not managed or monitored at the entity level, but rather an individual activity. So they looked at each, or they looked at a number of um, activities in isolation, okay? In isolation. And as a result of that, they didn't join the dots and realize that when you put these risks together, the sum of the parts was greater than the individual parts. We also saw that risk information was not reaching the board or board members were unable to understand the risks. And this, often the organization culture encouraged risk taking, probably because it led to higher bonuses. There was a disconnection between the corporation's overall risk strategy and the related procedures, okay? Risk management in many codes of corporate governance was not given pr prominence and Maybe the board didn't give it as much importance or maybe they felt that the organisation was looking after them. That wasn't their issue to consider. So many corporations are now endeavouring to introduce more formal and comprehensive risk management policies and procedures and integrate these into their corporate governance framework. Okay. In many countries, the task of business risk management has been delegated to the audit committee, okay? And you can see it there, they're sort of giving a bit of a, an overview of where the risk management lies. But at the end of the day, the board of directors needs that overview, because really the buck does stop with them, okay? Another important thing that we need to talk about is executive remuneration, okay? So the issue of remuneration for directors has been a contentious issue for a number of years, okay? The problems identified in the global financial crisis and public concerns have resulted in increased legislation to control executive compensation and to hopefully support shareholders' rights, okay? In the US, the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act includes executive compensation to be submitted for shareholder approval by a non-binding vote. So it means that the vote doesn't hold, which is kind of pointless if you think about it. Increased disclosure about the nature of compensation packages and payments related to financial performance. So what they're trying to do there is increase transparency I would note that there's been a move in recent years to actually get rid of that act um, with changes in government and that sort of stuff. It's a pretty contentious piece of legislation in the US with two parties, who, one who supports it and the other one who's against it. So it's kind of an interesting scenario there. Now, past problems arose because incentives and compensation designed to encourage maximization of profits resulted in short-term focus on the part of management. So if you were rewarded for profit, you focused on profit. So how do you maximize profit? Well, you might decide to use a poorer quality raw material. You might decide to use less or undertake less repairs and maintenance of your um, machinery. You may choose not to replace machinery and just use the older machinery. Now that's all well in the short term because it can maximize profit because you're not paying extra depreciation or you're not um, paying for repairs or increased raw materials. But if you're finding in the long run that the company, you know, the machine's breaking down, uh, supply can't be guaranteed to customers, customers are returning products because they've got an inferior product, while in the short time it might've helped you made a, make a profit in the long run, it can lead to a failure of the organization, okay? 
So the current focus is now on developing compensation packages that encourage management to think long-term and act in a way which enhances longer-term business performance, okay? So accounting has a central role in directing and controlling corporations. Actually, I'll just go back for a second. So what that means, in the past, you might've got a bonus if you earn a certain amount of profit. Nowadays, the best compensation schemes are made up of three factors, a wage, a short-term incentive, so you're gonna receive some sort of bonus if you meet, say, a profit target, but also they're now gonna give you a bonus if you meet a long-term, and they call that long-term incentive, and that might be based on something like share price, and you might have to hit a certain share price, say, after three years. So you don't just think short-term, you've now got to think long-term as well. So accounting has a central role in directing and controlling a corporation. So management accounting provides a significant part of the information on which company operations will be decided. Accounting provides the mean for outsiders to monitor the corporation and to assess the performance of those responsible for managing the corporation. The problem is, the accounting information that shareholders receive, management has a lot more information than the shareholders do. So there's a bit of an asymmetry there as to who has what level of information. So there's two ways in which accounting is used to direct and control the manage of a corporation. You can use accounting information to promote appropriate decisions, okay? through disclosure or through disclosures required by accounting standards, okay? So we can understand what sort of activities are being undertaken by management, okay? So one approach is, let's look at the accounting numbers, okay? Oh, sorry, take a step back. One approach is, is we say, well, we, if we want management to maximise profits, we're going to give them a profit target, okay? And so that profit, which is an accounting information, that's going to promote decisions by the management to increase profit. Alternatively, we can look at the disclosures that are required by the legislation, have a look at it and say, okay, what has our management been doing? So in one sense, we can use accounting numbers to um, promote management to act a certain way. Alternatively, we can just use accounting information to see what they've done, is what they're saying here. So the key role for financial reporting and corporate governance is to provide the information needed to assess the performance of the company and its managers. To be useful, the financial statements must be transparent, unbiased and complete, so there should be no earnings management, hopefully. So financial statements are a crucial link enabling shareholders to monitor directors' actions and to assist in identifying any deficiencies. But like I said, one of the problems is management has a lot more information than the shareholders do. Shareholders do. Now, historically and recently, there's been financial reporting failures. Okay. How does that happen? Well, choice of accounting methods may not be neutral or may not be unbiased, okay? And so, how can accounting cause financial reporting problems? Well, there can be incentives for management to manipulate profit. Why would they want to manipulate profit? Well, they might want to make sure that they reach a certain profit so that they're guaranteed of receiving a bonus, okay? So there's two keys incentives for profit manipulation. The contract or agency incentive from bonus contracts, i.e., I want to manipulate profit so I earn my bonus, or manipulating earnings to meet market expectations. Why? Because I want to meet the expectations of the analysts, because that makes me look like a better manager, particularly for when I go for my next job, I might be able to earn more. Now, corporate failures associated with poor accounting and corporate governance practices. So, corporate failure can be caused by poor strategic decisions by management, greed and the desire for power, 
ill-judged acquisitions. Maybe they weren't a good idea. Dominant CEOs who don't listen to other members of the organization who might be actually better or may know more about things. Failure of internal controls and boards that aren't effective. Key practices indicating a company's risk failure could be poor cash flows, disorganized internal accounting procedures, incomplete financial records. Now that's interesting because just before ABC Learning failed, they had on a number of occasions failed to produce their annual report and with its financial statements. Absence of budgets, loss-making activities, maybe continually increasing debt, defaulting on loans, or maybe the banks are getting very interested in how the company's been managed to make sure that they get paid what's owed to them. There could be outstanding creditors. You haven't paid them for more than 90 days. Maybe you've had to enter into instalment arrangements um, to make a plan to repay your creditors. You might not have paid your tax or your superannuation. You might find it difficult to obtain finance. And most potentially importantly, you might find that the good people leave because they see the writing on the wall. So the good principle, principles of good corporate or good governance that we look for include independent decision-making, especially by the board, not influenced by management, stock ownership, direct equality, and board activism. So transparency to external use of financial and other information, and also transparency within the organization. So people know what they're doing and can assess what they're doing. That's what transparency is about. Now, at the end of the day, Good corporate governance is about people making the right decisions. So the values a corporation develops and promotes is considered a key factor in good corporate governance. So examples would include the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, guidance by CPA Australia, Hong Kong Institute of Certified Public um, Accountants. They have um, ethical guidelines, the CFA Institute, have ethical guidelines. So the Anglo-Saxon model, as we said, places emphasis on shareholder interest dominating, i.e. maximizing shareholder wealth. Asia, they're moving towards this Anglo-Saxon model. In Europe, okay, there's a real focus on looking after stakeholders such as employees in France and creditors in Germany, okay? But it's likely that corporate governance is going to broaden. So we're gonna see a broadening of that in Australia. So we're not just gonna focus on shareholders, we're gonna be interested on wider stakeholder groups such as the environment and employee safety, okay? The principle-based approach prevails, backed by legislation, okay? And it's inevitable that future collapses and financial reporting failures will influence future directions. So in summary, there's a high level of interest in corporate governance. We defined corporate governance and why good corporate governance systems are needed. The relationship between positive accounting theory and corporate governance the key areas and the alternative approaches, as well as the recent developments in corporate governance. We also talked about the role and impact of accounting in and on corporate governance. We looked at the connection between corporate governance and corporate failure. We talked a little bit about ethics and we talked about some international perspectives, okay? Um, going back to what we looked at um, at the start of our lecture, we want to reflect on why there is such a high level of interest. Why will people want to protect their investments? We need to communicate what corporate governance is and why good corporate governance systems are needed. 
and look at that relationship like we talked about. We could reflect on the key areas, justify the alternative approaches, reflect on recent developments, and critically an analyze the role that accounting has. Justify the connection between corporate governance and corporate failure. We know there's a connection there. And critically analyze the role of ethics in corporate governance and reflect on international perspectives and development in corporate governance, okay? All right, guys, well, I'm just going to stop our share there. I hope you've enjoyed that video. It's actually a really important one. Um, and it's going to become more prominent as time goes on in the future. Thanks very much for listening. Uh, make sure you do um, any of the work assigned. And I will uh, talk to you next time. Okay, so thanks very much. Have a great day.